Good afternoon. Uh, this lecture is being presented as a part of the Asian Technology Conference in Mathematics 2018, which is to be held at the Yogyakarta State University from 20th to 24th November 2018. Before beginning, I would really like to thank the conference chair, Professor Wee Chi Yang, and the chair of the local organizing committee, Professor Shahid, uh, for helping me to deliver this lecture remotely. The topic of this uh, lecture is computational thinking in the mathematics classroom. Before I begin, I would like to present the outline of the talk. Uh, first, I would like to share an overview about computational thinking from different policy and curriculum documents and how they align with the goals of mathematics education. Rest of the lecture will focus on investigatory problems explored by students of secondary, senior secondary school, as well as pre-service teachers, where technology played a pivotal role in developing computational thinking. One can't talk of computational thinking without mentioning Samuel Papert. Way back in the 1960s, Samuel Papert uh, introduced the term computational thinking. He vividly talked about children using computers as instruments for learning, for enhancing creativity, innovation, and concretizing computational thinking. And perhaps Kunt offers a very uh, nice definition of computational thinking, saying that the essence of computational thinking is what we do while interacting with computers as extensions of our mind to create and discover. If you look at the ACM Pathways Report 2013, it says, by 2020, every one of two jobs in the STEM fields will be in computing. The Next Generation Science Standards also emphasizes the need to infuse computational thinking in high school mathematics. It highlights the growing importance of computation and digital technologies across scientific disciplines. If you look at curriculum documents, the, co the Common Core Guidelines of the United States says that students should be able to use technological tools to explore and deepen their understanding of concepts. So there is a huge pedagogical challenge here that especially mathematics educators are now faced with. How do we realize computational thinking in the mathematics classroom? Or rather, what is an actionable classroom ready definition of computational thinking? How does CT uh, translate into actual tasks and activities within the classroom that enhance computational thinking? And uh, how does the assessment take place? From a pedagogical perspective, the thoughtful use of computational tools and skill sets can deepen the learning of mathematics. And the motivation is that the rapidly changing nature of the scientific disciplines and the way they are being practiced in the professional world tells us that there is no other way but that we have to introduce computational thinking in mathematics and science. Winthrop et al. offers some of the skills of computational thinking, saying that these are, so there is a kind of a list here which says uh, CT deals with the ability to de deal with open-ended problems, persistence and confidence in dealing with complexity, representing ideas in computationally meaningful ways, breaking down problems into simpler ones, creative creating abstractions for aspects of the problem at hand, assessing strengths and weaknesses of a representation system, and generating algorithmic solutions. Well, this is just a list. But the primary motivation for bringing in computational thinking in the mathematics classroom is perhaps this, uh, you know, this reciprocal relationship that we can use computation and enriched by technology to enrich mathematics learning. And mathematics learning itself can provide many contexts to enrich computational thinking. Now I'd like to cite something from a very important curriculum document from India. This is the National Curriculum Framework of 2005. Mm -hmm. And uh, this curriculum document has really informed curricula and the preparation of textbooks throughout the country. It says the school mathematics needs to become activity oriented, accessible to all and affordable by all. And the emphasis should be on the relevance of mathematics. But it says a more important thing. It says that there needs to be a shift from content to processes. Uh, the content of the mathematics curriculum is all too well and fine. But the, within the classroom, the process, processes such as formal problem solving, estimation and approximation, 
use of patterns, visualization, reasoning and proof and so on should be emphasized. Explorations and investigatory problems involving computational thinking indeed have a great relevance here. And technology can help to uh, take over computations, reduce cognitive load, and offer opportunities to explore concepts in using multiple representations numerically, graphically, and symbolically. If we look at all the uh, technologies, the software tools available for mathematics instruction, perhaps broadly we can classify them into these four categories. The dynamic geometry software. There are many open source. In fact, right now I think there are more than 70 such tools available. Handle technology in the form of graphic calculators which are fairly powerful and can do many uh, important computations. Computer algebra systems which are very advanced and very powerful and spreadsheets. Now each of these can be uh, useful in a different context and it, it depends on the problem which is being explored. So if one were to explore a, a problem in geometry, one would probably resort to a GeoGebra or a Geometria sketchpad and help the student explore such problems. Handheld technologies such as graphic calculators have their own uh, set of advantages and they can really bring the power of technology right, uh, the power of visualization right onto the palm of the hand. Computer algebra systems may be used when a higher level of computation is required. So what, are, what is the nature of these computational thinking tasks? They should be investigatory in nature, they should lend themselves to explorations via technology. These could include mathematical modeling of real world problems or simulation of experiments. But more importantly, these problems should be uh, amenable to solutions via algorithms and computer programming. In this uh, talk, I will emphasize on three kinds of explorations which were done by students at various stages. First will be deal with the fractal explorations which lead to ideas of iteration and recursion. The second will be uh, the Tower of Hanoi, a puzzle which was explored by pre-service teachers. And then I will also cite some examples of projects which were based on mathematical modeling of real world problems. All of us are familiar with the idea of fractals. A fractal is a shape which can be broken into parts so that each part resembles the whole. This idea is known as self-similarity. Fractals can be generated recursively. And in fact, fractals are so much there in nature that Benoit Mandelbrot said that, you know, clouds are not spheres, mountains are not cones, coastlines are not circles, and bark is not smooth, nor does lightning travel in a straight line. So Euclidean geometry cannot really explain and cannot be used perhaps to an analyze nature, but fractal geometry can. Now, in this study, uh, 30 students of grade 9 had participated. They explored fractal geometry, which provided an authentic context for many generalization tasks. They used explicit and recursive reasoning to generalize patterns emerging from various fractal constructions. Understanding of self-similarity and iteration, which are integral to fractal geometry, were explored by the students, and they encountered many geometric sequences. So they analyzed these sequences and saw how the fractal growth really happens. And in this, uh, the role of technology was more in assisting with the numerical and graphical explorations. So the, uh, the Serpinski triangle is basically an equilateral triangle and the process, uh, so if you start with an equilateral triangle, you can uh, join the midpoints of the sides of the triangle and you will get four smaller triangles. The center triangle is removed. So now it leads to three other small, smaller triangles. And the same process is repeated on each of these smaller triangles. And it goes on. So the initial stage is referred to as stage zero. Now the students were given tasks like, uh, which involve generalization by analogy like how many shaded triangles or black triangles will be there at the fourth and fifth stages and generalization by extension that can you really find a rule for the number of shaded triangles at the nth stage so one is to do the number of shaded triangles the next uh, aspect which they were asked to look at is that suppose the area of the shaded triangle at stage zero is one square unit 
then what will be the subsequent areas? So it led to very interesting explorations and students explored the Sierpinski triangle pictorially, numerically and graphically using multiple representations. Now it was not possible to draw the picture after a certain stage because it gets fairly complex. But they were able to create a spreadsheet where they wrote the number of stages, they uh, input a formula for the number of shaded triangles and they could see that the number of shaded triangles grows uh, in powers of 3, whereas the shaded area actually approaches 0. When they graphed this, it became even more visually clear that the number of shaded triangles is growing very fast, whereas the shaded area grows to 0. Further, from the pictorial representation, they could also observe self-similarity. So, stage 1 has 3 copies of stage 0, stage 2 has 3 copies of stage 1, and so on. So at every subsequent stage, they could see copies of the previous stages. And this was a very important observation. And post this, there were different kinds of tasks, practical tasks given to students. Somebody explored, some group explored the Serpinski carpet, which is on a square. You trisect the, uh, the sides of the square and you divide this, basically you divide the square at stage zero into nine smaller squares and remove the center square. And when this is repeated, it leads to a very intricate and beautiful pattern. This is a snapshot of a student's work. And then she challenged the others to, um, she asked questions like, at stage 2 or at stage 3, what is it, how much is the red area? And to compute that, students had to use the idea of uh, geometric sequences. Another group uh, decided to divide the square again into nine smaller squares and they removed the yellow portions. And if this idea is repeated, then this particular fractal uh, leads to powers of 5. They even wrote recursive and explicit rules such as b of n is equal to 5 bn minus 1, where b of n represents the number of black squares at the nth stage. And they also came up with the explicit rule that b of n is 5 raised to the power n. So they could actually see visually what these geometric sequences are. Uh, after that, students, uh, different groups of students worked and they tried to, to, they were given the task of creating their own fractals. So another group looked at a square and they uh, installed squares on the different sides of a given square leading to a shape like this. And then the same idea was repeated and they explored uh, the area that would be enclosed by this um, shape at say, at higher stages. And it was a very interesting uh, intricate pattern that they developed. In all the fractals, students looked at number of line segments, perimeter, area. They even created three-dimensional objects like fractal cards. This led to much excitement as students could see cell, the cell similarity within the cells of the fractal card. The next task that I am going to describe here is the Tower of Hanoi puzzle, which was explored by a group of pre-service teachers. The aim of the study was to enable the teachers to engage in explicit and recursive reasoning, to help them explore the mathematical ideas encapsulated in the Tower of Hanoi puzzle using multiple representations that is pictorial, numerical, symbolic and graphical. They were also asked to represent the problem in their own ways using different representations and to assess the strengths and weaknesses of these representations. Many of you may be familiar with the Tower of Hanoi puzzle. Uh, the original uh, problem consists of three pegs of uh, three uh, pegs and circular discs of reducing radii which are positioned on one of the pegs. The problem lies in shifting this tower of discs from one peg to another uh, using only two conditions that at a time only one disc can be moved and the second condition is that at no given time can a bigger disc be placed on top of a smaller one. So initially when the students were asked to play the puzzle, I mean, they were divided into groups of two and three and uh, they were asked to estimate the minimum number of moves for six discs. Uh, some of them estimated 30 moves, some of them estimated 80 moves and they were, it was a hit and trial going on. Then uh, they realized that the problem needs to be simplified. So I asked them what would happen if there were only two discs, what would be the minimum number of moves? Now there's a nice small animation here 
so let me see if I can show this animation. Uh, so let us look at this animation where uh, this is the Tower of Hanoi puzzle with only two discs. So what will be the minimum number of moves? So clearly the smaller disc is moved first, then the bigger disc is moved to another peg and the smaller disc comes on top of that and this requires only three moves. So students were then asked uh, what would happen if there were say uh, three discs instead of two and they here they again uh, played around and then they saw that the minimum number of moves was actually seven. So if we try to see uh, the case for seven uh, for three discs let us try to see uh, So if I look at this animation, one can manipulate this and reduce the number of pegs to three and the disc also to three. And when I ask the animation to show the solution, it shows the seven moves. Now here we see an interesting pattern. The top two discs require three moves to be shifted to another peg. The biggest disc now comes onto one of the pegs and again three moves are required to shift the other two discs leading to a total of seven. So uh, the students were able to now see a pattern here and uh, so let us so they kept on increasing the number of discs so for four discs they now figured out that there should be 15 that is seven plus one plus seven that is 15 number of moves and so on. So somewhere they were able to uh, write a recursive, represent this using a recursive rule that the minimum number of moves for n discs would be, that is t of n would be twice the minimum number of the previous number of discs plus 1. Having uh, figured out the recursive rule, then they were then asked, okay, what would be the generalized rule? So here they were asked to focus on the sequence of the minimum number of moves, that is 3, 7, 15, 31 and so on. Relating them to powers of 2, they realized that the explicit rule for the minimum number of moves is actually 2 raised to the power n minus 1. So up to this stage there was a lot of excitement as students were playing around with the concrete model and they were actually tabulating their, uh, the, their solutions and trying to generalize the uh, pattern to obtain both the recursive as well as the explicit rule. But this was just a conjecture that the minimum number of moves is 2 raised to the power n minus 1. To formally prove it, they had to do it by mathematical induction. In the in induction, first we verified, which is trivially true, that if there's only one disk, then there would only be one move required. Then we assume the statement to be true for n equal to k. So let's suppose t of k is 2 raised to k minus 1 for some natural number k, then we are required to prove the t of k plus 1 will be 2 raised to the k plus 1 minus 1. To prove this, one can easily use the recursive rule and we are able to prove it. After this, the Tower of Hanoi uh, in a new session, it led to some very interesting counting problems. So they were asked, for example, uh, how many ways can you arrange two discs on three pegs? And they were asked to show this pictorially. So one response was like this. So here, for example, if you have a bigger and a smaller disc, both the disc can be on one of the pegs. And there are nine ways of, uh, of representing this, of positioning these two discs. And uh, the students were excited. Initially, they thought there would be only six ways, but then when they actually uh, represented it pictorially, they saw there are nine ways. And now they were asked, one, they had, to, uh, they had to be told a more convenient way of representing these. So they decided that we, uh, the pegs will be numbered as 0, 1 and 2. And suppose both the discs are on peg 0, then this state will be referred to as 0, 0. Whereas in this case, if the bigger disc is on peg 0 and the smaller disc is on peg 1, then this state will be referred to as 0, 1. Then they were asked, how will you represent the transitions between the states? So which are the states, I mean, can you go from one state to another using only one move? And which are these states? And they use very interesting representations, like one student, one group uh, came up with this kind of a representation. 
where they wrote the two digit numbers to represent the nine states and then they used arrows. So here the red arrow represents the cases where a single move is possible to move from that state to the other and the blue arrows represent the situation where the move is not possible. But this was the most appropriate time to represent the concept of the Hanoi graphs. A Hanoi graph is a highly uh, symmetric combinatorial graph. This is of the form HPD, where P represents the number of pegs and D represents the number of disks. Now let us take the case. Let us look at what will be H13. In this case, there are three pegs and only one disk. And that one disk can be placed on any one of the pegs numbered 0, 1, and 2. If the disk happens to be on peg 0, it is represented by a vertex uh, named 0. If the and a single move can shift it to peg 1, so we have a vertex peg 1, and these two are connected by an edge because a single move can help transition from this state to this state. So it is possible to go from any one of these states to any other, so there is a triangular pattern here. And this is H13. Now the students would ask that can you create H23? H23 is the case of three pegs and two disks. The arrangements are like this and it was convenient to arrange them in this manner. So 0, 0 represents the situation where both the disks are on the same peg and from this state you can go to either this state or this state using only one move. So we join those by edges. So this whole situation is represented by H23 and now subsequently the students were automatically curious that what would H33 look like and finally when with some facilitation and discussion when H2, H33 actually emerged this is what it looked like. Fascinating. The students were fascinated. The first reaction was that oh my god look in H33 there are three copies of H23. And then somebody pointed out that, well, in H23, there are three copies of H13. So they had begun to see the self-similar structure, and all of them agreed that this resembles the Sierpinski triangle. And uh, so this self-similar structure was represented by some students. For example, this particular student actually used color coding to show that in H23, there are three triangles with vertices, the blue, yellow, and pink uh, vertices. And these are also visible in the H33. So in general, HPD has P copies of HPD minus 1. Mathematica offers a very uh, simple command. So if you use a table command and the graph data within it and generate the Hanoi graph, say from n going from 1 to 5, these are the, uh, these are the Hanoi graphs from H13 to H53. And as you can see, this is a this is a very uh, similar to the Sierpinski like pattern. The Hanoi graphs also led to other counting problems like how many vertices are there in HPD. So this is clearly p raised to the power d. Uh, because uh, let us take the case of H23 uh, where there are two disks and three pegs, uh, so that is three square, which is nine states, and therefore nine vertices. Then they were asked that what would be the number of edges and they counted this using self-similarity. So H13 had three edges and H, so let's look at H13, it has three edges. H23 now has three copies of H13, so it is three times three. And then there are interconnections between these triangles. So that is another three edges, so that leads to 12 edges. Now similarly, H33 will have three times of 12 plus three, which is 27 edges and so on. So again, this was generalized using a recursive rule that the number of edges in Hn3 is going to be 3 times the number of edges in Hn minus 1, 3 plus 3. This is a recursive rule, but with a lot of facilitation and discussion, again, the explicit rule for the number of edges in HPD was also figured out. I think uh, the next stage was really interesting because the next stage of the exploration made the students connect the Hanoi graphs with the minimum number of moves and they identified paths within these Hanoi graphs. So for example in H2, uh, H23 uh, the shortest path from 0, 0 to 2, 2 is this path which passes through these two vertices and it consists of three edges that is 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, 1, and 2, 2. 
and these represent the three moves for two discs. Similar paths were found in H33 and H43 also, though they had not drawn H43, they were able to find, let us say, the shortest path between the situation where all four discs would be on peg 0 and when they were moved to peg 2, then these are the 15 number of moves. So they were able to explore the problem. So by this time, they were exploring the Hanoi graph, Hanoi, uh, Tower of Hanoi puzzle using only numerical representations. So they had moved from concrete to pictorial to numerical. The most wonderful part of this project was perhaps the thought of extension to four and larger number of pegs. Interesting Hanoi graphs, beautiful looking intricate Hanoi graphs were created. So this is H14 and as we can see in H24 there are four copies of H14 and interconnections between them and so on. Uh, the students created Hanoi graphs for this four peg case. They developed an insight into the emerging fractal like structures. They identified paths for the minimum number of moves within the four peg case and they also tried to conjecture a formula. So by the end of this, uh, I was able to evidence a, panora a panoramic view of computational thinking. In the first session, students were just uh, doing a trial and error with the concrete model. They enumerated the minimum number of moves, found recursive and explicit formulae, and then proved by mathematical induction. By the time we reached session two, the students had begun creating their own pictorial representations. They were explained the idea of Hanoi graphs and they identified self-similarity within these and also counted the number of vertices and edges. In session three, they focused on the minimum number of moves and they made a connection between the puzzle and the Hanoi graphs through numerical representations. And finally, in session four, they were able to extend this to the fourth peg case. So far, we have witnessed two, uh, two different projects. One were, were students of grade 9 and 10 explored fractals, and the other were pre-service teachers uh, explore the Tower of Hanoi puzzle. And in both cases, we saw some evidence of computational thinking. I would now like to uh, talk about the project's uh, project-based approach for mathematical learning and this can indeed provide a great opportunity for developing computational thinking. The project-based approach has of course been advocated by all the stalwarts like John Dewey, Jean Piaget, Brunner and Samuel Papert. But then this is a shift away from the traditional school curriculum where we have ready-made lesson plans and predefined objectives. But what are these projects? I mean, how does one, where does one find them? Well, in fact, they have to be found, discovered, invented, or designed with the active involvement of teachers. These projects can actually enable learners to engage in the processes uh, of learning mathematics, such as visualization, exploration, seeking patterns, making conjectures, all those processes, you know, which earlier I highlighted in the National Curriculum Framework. And of course, uh, in the process of uh, engaging students in this approach to learning, the teacher's role will change from that of transmitter of learning to that of a facilitator. In this slide, I'm just highlighting some examples of projects which were done by students of, uh, mostly with students of grades 11 and 12, that is at the senior secondary school level. Let's to just to cite some examples. Uh, there was a project on app exploring applications of mathematics to genetics which was based on matrices and probability. Here the students tried to predict the genotype distribution of a plant population after any number of generations. And of course they used Mathematica and other, uh, a little bit of Excel uh, to help them in their computations. The topic of cryptography is very interesting to students at this uh, level. And you know, exploring, let us say the RSA algorithm or the Hill cipher method, which involves matrices is of course uh, not too difficult for them. In fact, there was a group of students who uh, explored these uh, algorithms and they tried to modify the method so that cracking the algorithm would become more difficult. Some also wrote programs in C++ as it was the language that they were learning in computer science at that time. I've already described, described the exploration of fractals by uh, students at the secondary school. 
Newton's method in fractal patterns is again an interesting area. Uh, exploring the nth roots of unity by plotting the Newton's basins of attractions led to a very interesting project and probably if time permits, I will highlight that as well. Queuing models were also explored where students analyzed queuing models at a petrol pump uh, and at a fast food counter and suggested ways to optimize profits and reduce waiting time of customers. Fourier series and its applications can also be a very interesting area of application. And the one that I'm going to focus on is that of cellular automata, a topic which can very much uh, be brought to the level of high school. Now, cellular automata has wide ranging applications to various areas such as image processing, cryptography, neural networks, uh, biological systems. Essentially, a cellular automata is a mathematical model for a system in which simple components act together to produce complicated patterns of behavior. And the analysis of this behavior can be done using the models of cellular automata. So therefore, they are also used to model traffic flow, crystal growth, and colony forest fires, and so on. And this topic lends itself to very interesting investigations, as I said, which are well within the reach of high school students. Uh, so just to uh, introduce a few preliminaries, because otherwise one would not be able to understand what the students worked on. A cellular automata develops on a grid of cells. Each cell has a state, which is dead or alive. So a dead cell can be represented with the number 0 and a live cell with the number 1, or they can be given colors white and black respectively. Each cell in the grid has a neighborhood, so that is a neighboring cells. And a cellular automata, most importantly, must have a defining rule based on which it grows and evolves in discrete time steps. Uh, so let's take the example of this. So here is a linear grid of eight cells in which the fifth cell is a live cell, but all other cells are dead. So we can say that this cell has value 1, whereas all the other cells have value 0. Now, given any set of three neighboring cells, so every neighborhood here, let's say, consists of uh, three cells. So for example, this live cell has two neighbors, one to its left and one to its right. Now, each group or uh, each set of three cells uh, can have eight possible configurations as every cell can either be have value 0 or 1. So these are these uh, the eight possible config numerical configurations and each of these configurations can be assigned to a cell in the next row. So in the cellular automata this can be the initial row. The next row will have another set of cells but how these cells evolved will be given by some pattern, some rule and let that rule be that if all the cells are alive uh, then it would lead to a dead cell. And if two first two cells are alive and the third one is dead, then also it would lead to a dead cell and so on. So if this is the pattern, which we can re represent pictorially like this. So let's take this case. You have one dead cell and two live cells. So the cell in the next row in the middle will turn out to be a live cell. So if we, uh, this is a defining rule for this particular cellular automata. Now, given this defining rule, let us observe that we can define this rule as 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, and 0. But this is nothing but a binary number. And its actual decimal representation, if we expand in powers of 2, is 30. So this rule is called rule 30. But each of these eight neighborhood configurations may be assigned to a different set of zeros and ones and that would lead to a different cellular automata. These are referred to as the elementary cellular automata. And since each of these uh, eight groups of uh, three cells may be assigned to zeros and ones, there are two raised to the power eight, that is 256 possible assignments. And therefore, there are 256 elementary cellular automata rules. These were widely explore, explored by Wolfram, and they were classified as well. And here there was a student who wanted to work on this project and was very intrigued by it and wanted to explore these 256 elementary cellular automata. So we embarked on this project of exploring these 256 ECAs uh, and represent these in different forms using decimal, binary and Boolean forms. 
but more importantly, we wanted to understand the classification which has been given by Stephen, Stephen Wolfram. And to do this aspect, they needed uh, the student was given access to Mathematica, and also there was an open source software called Niku, which helped to see how these ECAs evolve with time. Post that, their sensitive, sensitivity analysis was done to see how each of these ECAs, how sensitive it is it to changes in the initial conditions. And ultimately, the student was uh, ambitious and wanted to create a new automaton of his own using a totalistic approach. So in this slide, we are just, uh, this is just to show the different ways a given cellular automata ECA can be represented. So this is the defining rule pictorially shown and the binary representation would be this, that is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. In decimal form, it is the number 30. And the same thing, using the concept of Carnot maps can be represented using a Boolean rule. Each of these representations is useful in different contexts. Now let us take the case of rule 30. So let us see. Mathematica has a program, an inbuilt command called cellular automaton, which generates this. So let's take a, a grid of square cells. And the topmost row is the initial row, which has a live cell in the center. Uh, the rules, as given above, are used to generate each row. So each row depends on the position. So for example, if I take a cell here, the value of the cell would depend on the three cells just above it. And since three white cells leads to a white cell, so this cell would remain white. However, in this case, there are two, there is a, there are two white cells with the black cell in the center. And this situation, in this situation, the cell in the middle and the next row would be a live cell. So this is a cell value one. If you continue this pattern, this shows about 20 rows of rule 30 and what it looks like. Mathematica's array plot and cellular automaton command helps us to generate. So while this is only 10 rows of the rule 30, this is 100 rows of rule 30. And we can see a very interesting, uh, there is no fixed pattern here. It seems to be very random. And you can see these little white triangles emerging. Of course, colors can also be assigned. To make the cellular automata look more attractive. Now, the student explored use used the Mathematica command to, ex to generate all 256 automata and there were some commonalities which were observed. So many of the cellular automata could be termed to be uniform but all cells and ended up in either being black or white. So for example, if you look at rule 151, all cells are black. Some were repetitive. Repetitive means that there were regular alternating patterns or a block of cells which repeat themselves throughout. So in this case, uh, there, in this rule 4, there is a single line. So every row has a single live cell in the center, leading to this kind of a pattern. But rule 50 has alternating squares of black and white. Rule 6 is non-stationary because the same pattern is repeated in every row but in a different position. Then there were nested patterns, some like the rule 126 led to a Sierpinski-like pattern, whereas rule 105 led to a different nested pattern. Rule 30 we have already seen. This was a fourth category where there was, there was a random category where there is no fixed pattern and there are, the evolution of these CAs were highly unpredictable. In the sensitive anal analysis, uh, we tried to see that if you make a very slight variation in the initial condition, so in the initial row, if you just change the color of one of the cells, what happens to that C ECA? Now, in this case, rule 151 was a simple uniform uh, case where all the cells were black. But by making a simple change in the initial condition, it led to a Sierpinski-like structure. So this was really amazing. Now, in rule 106, it is a single uh, diagonal line of cells, of black cells, but a slight change in the initial condition led to a very random pattern. So this sensitivity analysis was very interesting. But now the student moved on to uh, trying to see how he could develop his own cellular automaton. And 
the totalistic approach was adopted. So in this approach, a cellular automata uh, is a is this is a, like the totalistic cellular automata is a automata in which the rules depend only on the total value of all the cells in a neighborhood. Now suppose I take the case of a five cell neighborhood. So given one cell, there are two, two cells to the left and two cells to the right. Obviously, there would be two raised to the power five possibilities, that is 32 possibilities for coloring these cells. And all these 32 neighborhoods can lead to two, because each of these can be assigned to zeros and ones, they it would lead to two raised to the power 32, which is a huge number of possible cellular automata. So in using the totalistic approach, what was done was this one took the sum values of all the cells. So if all the five cells have value one, then the sum would be five. And let us say we assign that to one. But if there's only one white cell and the remaining cells are uh, black, then the sum would be four and we so suppose we assign it to one. So like that, there are only six possible sums, that is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5, and each of these may be assigned to zeros and ones. So this would lead to only 2 raised to the power 6, that is 64 possible automata. Now let us look at this particular case. This is These numbers 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 is actually the binary representation of 53. And when this was applied on a grid of cells, just as the previous elementary cellular automata was, it led to a very beautiful, intricate pattern, a kind of fern-like pattern, which was symmetrical. This, by the way, was developed. The student wrote a Java code to develop this. It was a very evolved program. And then, the, the, since the number of automata ranged from 0 to 63, this is rule 53, but since it ranged from 0 to 63, it was not impossible to look at each of those and observe them carefully. So again, uh, we notice uniform patterns where all the cells were either black or white. Then there were repetitive patterns, alternating rows of black and white. Uh, this is another case of a repetitive pattern and even nested Sierpinski-like patterns such as rule 6. Uh, the nested, all these cellular automata, if you notice, were symmetrical. But uh, if you look at the first half, this gives a nested structure. This gives a random, there is no specific pattern here. And there were also the case where uh, the rule were, represented a chaotic pattern. Now, so broadly, you know, these were the classifications. These numbers, uh, these rule numbers were uniform in nature. Some had black with uniform borders. These numbers represented repetitive patterns. Then there were nested ones, random, chaotic. And rule 57 was a special case, which was a very interesting pattern, which we showed in the slide before. A little feedback from the student was taken, and uh, the student's name is Rohin. And uh, he uh, is presently doing his undergraduate studies. And he said that working on this project was a great experience. Uh, it, is, it was my first venture into research and it gave me a solid understanding on how to approach untraversed areas in mathematics. Uh, it gave him an uh, opportunity to synchronize abstract automaton framework with the GUI and to see how patterns are produced. So this was a very encouraging uh, feedback and also showed the possibility that it is not impossible for students at the senior secondary level, that is in grades 11 and 12, to do some serious research and exploration. Yet another uh, project I'm going to just whiz past this because of uh, uh, paucity of time. Uh, Newton's method and fractal patterns are also very uh, interesting. Now, Newton's method helps us to approximate the zeros of a polynomial using this rule. So the x n minus n plus 1 is xn minus f of xn upon f dash xn. So if you define Newton's function like this, the iterates, so if you start with an initial seed z0, the Newton's iterates would ultimately converge to a zero of the function. We are, we are now looking at uh, the complex polynomials. Now students were familiar with the Newton's method from, the, from a course that they studied. But here they spend their focus on iterating different complex valued functions 
and we use mathematical programming to do that. So if you take the case of fz which is z square plus 1, it has two roots i and minus i. So Mathematica was used to plot the basins of attraction that is b of i and b of minus i. So what do we mean by a basin of attraction? So all those points in the complex plane whose iterates converge to the root i are referred to as b of i, the basin of attraction for i and likewise for b of i minus i. And interestingly we, uh, the plane, the complex plane was divided, Mathematica output showed two different half planes. So one is b of i and the other is b of minus i. Then for the function fz is zq minus 1, the Newton's iterates converge to the cube roots of unity. But the pattern is quite intricate and, and amazing. So uh, three different colors were given to the three different bases and we see that uh, because there are three roots of unity and enlarging three cube roots of unity and enlarging a bulb shows us that it resembles the larger bulb. So if you take a small bulb here and enlarge it, it resembles this bulb and so on. So there is a self-similar capital structure also within these patterns. Somebody said, okay, now, now I would like to explore for the fourth uh, roots of unity and uh, so took the function fz which is z4 minus 1 and the four basins of attraction in four different colors and so on for z5 minus 1. Interestingly, one student tried to see what happens if the exponent is not integer and found that suppose you were to uh, find the roots of fz that is z raised, raised to the power 5.3 minus 1, a sixth, pet, sixth uh, petal-like structure would emerge. So when students were asked to give their feedback, they said that we, have, we were familiar with Newton's method only as a method for approximating zeros of polynomials in the real line. In this project, we learned how to compute iterates of Newton's functions in the complex plane. But the real beauty of all this became clear only when we used Mathematica. So they, of course, realized that without the use of a computational package like Mathematica, it would not be possible for them to explore this problem. Uh, another person said that we were also able to see the fractal patterns within the basins of attraction. Again, all this would not have been possible without Mathematica. So I would like to now conclude, you start concluding here by saying that mathematics projects, these kind of projects provided a very rich environment for computational thinking. The student feedback was indeed excellent. They owned their projects. It was really their work and they were responsible for their own learning. It encouraged group work and everyone participated in some form or the other. Technology was an amplifier because it gave them access to higher level concepts and increased the sco scope and range of activities. For example, in each of these explorations, without technology, they could not have explored the problem any further. Technology also worked as a reorganizer. In, the sequence was never the same. All the same sequence did not work for all the projects. So in some projects, they would have to understand the mathematics conceptually and then define the problem and then begin to explore it. In another project, they could be focusing more on the programming part and how to get the graphic images and explore patterns within the graphic images. The outcomes of these projects were not predefined. There was a sense of suspense and many aha moments and students reveled in asking what if questions. The best part was that, you know, they were, uh, they got ample opportunity to present their projects in various mathematical fairs, science fairs and competitions and inter-school competitions. So again there was this huge excitement of group work and teamwork and so on. In all these projects in some form they do elicit computational thinking because students were selecting between representations, creating new ones, they were simplifying and generalizing problems or they were making conjectures as we could see in the Tower of Hanoi problem. They were even generating new questions for exploration in each, each of these projects. In most of the cases, they developed their own programs uh, and used the outputs for further explorations. Some of them who were very adept with uh, C++ programming, they used, or Java, they used that. But those who had access to Mathematica sometimes chose to use that or maybe even a spreadsheet. So overall, 
the math projects uh, really engaged students and it was it actually led to the development of what we could really call a computational mathematics lab i would now like to conclude by sharing some of the implications that computational thinking could have for the curriculum so the inclusion of technology enabled computational thinking explorations will imply that we need to include mathematical modeling and applications and computer programming as well as discrete math within the school curriculum uh, redesigning of the curriculum will be necessary the pedagogy will have to be rethought out to bring about that shift from content to processes that the national curriculum framework talked about most importantly the considered use of appropriate technology will help to restore the balance between the need for computational skills and the need for experiencing processes such as exploration and conjecture but they would uh, uh, this also implies that there would be a large scale or there needs to be a large scale orientation of teachers to a pedagogy that really inculcates computational thinking well i would now like to end with a quote um, quoting from the mind storms written by samuel papert who said that before computers there were very few good points of contact between what is most fundamental and engaging in mathematics and anything firmly planted in everyday life but the computer a mathematics speaking being so to say in the midst of everyday life of the home school and the workplace is able to provide such links but the challenge of education is to find ways to exploit this so with this i would like to conclude my presentation and i would like to thank the viewers for a very patient hearing and look forward to interesting suggestions from everyone for inculcating and bringing in computational thinking in the mathematics classroom thank you very much